Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sumit. Uh, I lead the small kernel team inside of LCG. We are going to talk about a few uh, things of interest that don't fall into a larger set, so it's it's just a condensed set of lightning talks here. Uh, that's the short agenda. Uh, John is going to talk about the GKI stuff, gen com uh, generic kernel images. Um, Amit and Orson are not here, so I'm going to talk about their uh, slides, which are basically ASP and Dragonboard DB845C and uh, Pixel 3 with mainline kernel. I will talk about uh, mainline form factor devices. It's just a sort of a continuation. Then uh, Orson uh, was supposed to talk about helping, how do we help upstream LTP DDT into LTP? So I'll just give a status on that. And then uh, in the end, Yonkin will talk about uh, LCR LKF build. So over to John. Hey, so my name is John Stoltz. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Android effort for using a generic kernel image, uh, otherwise known as GKI. Um, just a disclosure kind of up front, I you know, have no sort of official uh, uh, instructions or word. Um, that none of this is uh, really official uh, from Google. Um, if you do have any questions, I highly recommend you email the kernel team at Android or talk to your Google TAM. Um, so this is just kind of out, uh, things that I've discovered as I've gone through this process. Um, so a quick overview of the uh, generic kernel image uh, efforts. Um, basically, you know, the desire is to have a single kernel that will work across uh, all of the devices of the architecture. Um, and in order to do that, they want to use kernel modules. Um, now, a lot of kind of classic Linux distributions could probably say, oh, hum, we've been doing this forever. Um, but this is a slightly different take. Um, instead of using one kind of kernel source and one configuration, um, you know, that the kernel image and all of the modules get built out of, um, this one's a little more, this is just different because the only thing that's going to come out of the GKI source is the kernel image. And then the idea is that the vendors need to bring their own modules. And this may come from separate source trees that are hopefully based upon their first. Um, and so this is, it gets a little bit more confusing and, and uh, delicate uh, to keep it all going. Um, there's been a bunch of background presentations at Linux Plumbers over the last couple of years. Um, I've got links here in the slides, but uh, you can also just Google it up uh, and find those on the web. Um, so just kind of getting started, um, basically you can either grab the Android uh, 419R or Android mainline trees in the common git. Uh, tree, um, and if, you know, the main kind of component here is looking at that uh, def, the GKI def config. Um, that's kind of going to define what the generic kernel uh, is going to be configured as. Um, as far as in user space, you need to have the, mo the mod alias handling enabled um, in your U of NRC. And then there's these two uh, board vendor kernel modules and board vendor RAM disk kernel modules. Uh, that need to be added to the device MK, and that basically lists the modules that will be included on the vendor image as well as in the initRD. Um, and I've got some examples for what I did for the HiKey and HiKey 960 with the links there. Um, so kind of phase one on this, um, you want to start with a working vendor tree that's against the Android 419 or Android mainline tree, uh, kernels. Um, once you have something that's up and running on your device, you want to start diffing your device config that the, the working device config uh, against the GKI def config. Um, and basically run through that diff and try to minimize it as much as possible making changes to the device def config. Um, this is super slow, very rote, kind of boring work. You kind of twiddle something, see if it works, twiddle something, see if it works. Um, you know, there's, I, I don't know of any shortcut around this. Um, once you're kind of down to that just minimum config, you want to start enabling modules. Um, I recommend starting with the most peripheral functionality on the device, um, like the, the least critical for booting. Um, so things like Wi-Fi, USB, you know, Bluetooth, that sort of thing, and sort of start moving inwards towards things like storage, the clocks and regulators, et cetera. Um, as you're going through and trying to minimize that Delta, so that you know, ideally, you'd want to have uh, the difference between the GKI def config is a bunch of config options that are set as M. Um, but you're not going to get there because on one side, there's a lot of config options that are specific to a module or to a driver itself. And so it's going to be a Boolean, but it only affects the driver, it doesn't affect the core kernel. 
Um, so it's going to take a little bit of analysis to, to see which, which of those you, you run into. Um, and then the other part, too, is there are a lot of, uh, I guess, drivers that are in the kernel that just aren't enabled for modules yet. So you will run into a few of those as well. Um, Basically, what you want to do is once you get kind of down uh, to that minimal set. Oh, the other aspect too, um, you know, trying to figure out which modules need to be in the NRD, in the NRD uh, can be a little complicated. Um, sort of what I have as sort of a hack that I used uh, was just basically setting all of them as RAM disk modules. Um, this is probably not what you want to use long term, um, but you know, at least in the short term, it's not really that different from having all of those built in into one kernel image uh, to begin with. Um, and basically, you want to get to the point where you're able to take that device def config, build the kernel, have it load up, do an Alice mod, and see all the modules that you expect are loaded and working. Um, and that's sort of the end of phase one there. Um, the next step is to go through and take the vendor tree that you have that was working with modules and just build the GKI def config um, and try to swap that in for that vendor kernel that you just uh, were using in the previous step. Um, this won't work right off. Um, you're going to run into a lot of issues. Uh, usually, as the modules load, they'll be missing symbols. Um, and this is kind of a common issue because quite often when you select a module or a driver, um, it will have inside of the kconfig a dependency on some other config that it selects and turns on. Um, and so that selected config, uh, sometimes being called kind of a, a hidden config, um, isn't something that will be in the GKI def config right off. Um, so, this is something that Android developers are familiar with. Um, kind of the workaround at this stage is uh, the preferred workaround is to add a dummy kconfig that selects what you want, uh, submit that, and a change to the GKI def config to enable it. And that way, the, the core kernel will have that support inside it. Um, as you kind of go through and figure out what changes, are going to be needed uh, to get that uh, vendor tree building with the GKI def config. Um, you want to start submitting those GKI def config changes up to Garrett uh, to get reviewed uh, into the common tree. Um, that said, when you do submit these, this is sort of a negotiation step that's kind of going on with Google. Um, do expect to get some pushback. A lot of the times, you know, people will say, hey, you need to go fix that upstream. Um, sometimes there's cases where you say, hey, you know, this, this driver doesn't uh, support modules at this point. They'll say, oh, that's a bug, go fix it. Um, and so this may, you know, not be, this may be something that's affected the upstream kernel, so uh, uh, you kind of have to go off and do that. Um, once you've kind of gotten all of that steps kind of worked out and all of the changes that you need to the GKI kernel um, have been merged, um, at that point what you should be able to do is to check out the common Android for 19R or the Android mainline tree, build with the pure GKI def config, no changes, and swap it for the vendor kernel. And if you've gotten that working, hurrah, it's a success, you're there. Um, the last little step here that I'd recommend is uh, to create a config fragment. So basically from the GKI def config that you were working with and your device def config, um, basically do a diff of that, save that delta as a config fragment, um, and this is just really useful because as the GKI is kind of being modified to enable changes that other vendors need as well, um, this allows you to follow along. So you can use the merge config tool um, to basically apply your config fragment on top of the base GKI def config. Um, and it just makes it a little easier to track. Um, kind of general recommendations uh, that I have on this. Uh, so first of all, reach out to the kernel team at Android. Try to make sure you're on the right lists. Um, the second item is I really recommend starting with Android mainline, uh, not the Android 419R, um, because when you do submit kind of the changes that you need for the GKI uh, uh, def config, you know, Greg Crow Hartman or whoever will say, you know, yeah, that needs to be fixed upstream. That means you're going to have to go be able to validate that change upstream. Um, so you might as well be working against the mainline kernel as you do this. Um, I kind of made the mistake in the initial pass with Heike and Heike 960, and I, I, I did it against the 419 tree first, um, and then I realized, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to make those changes. But then I had to repeat that whole def config minimization step. It was kind of very painful and took a couple days to, to, to reproduce all of this on the Android common, or on the um, 
Android mainline tree. Um, so I, I just would suggest starting there. Um, third thing was just to use config fragments. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, once you've gotten that working uh, uh, vendor, GKI def config. Um, but once you do have that config fragment, I still recommend that the generated uh, def config that you create with that. So when you take the GKI con uh, def config, you merge it with your config fragment, the resulting def config, I would commit that to your tree. Um, and the reason is, is as changes come in through the GKI def config, it'll be just helpful that if you do run into a regression, it's easier to back up and figure out what, what might have changed that broke you. Um, and then finally, uh, participate on the list. That would be great to see vendors talking. So far, it's been pretty quiet. Um, as far as to-dos, these are things kind of I've, I haven't yet gotten to or things that I think that probably will be needed to be addressed. Um, there's this build ABI script that will help validate that the uh, uh, the source that you're building from is compatible with the GKI ABI. ABI. Um, I haven't gotten to tinker around with it. Uh, documentation is supposedly coming or something on that. Um, there is, uh, the other part is collecting the kernel modules is a little messy right now. If you try to use like uh, make modules install or something, it will install it into kind of this device or this directory hierarchy um, that uh, is kind of makes the modules harder to uh, uh, load in the uh, device.mk um, config or build config. Um, so I don't know. Right now I've kind of just got a bad script that just fetches them all up the all of the KO modules and, and copies it to the right tree. But I, I feel like that we could have some sort of improvement upstream to make this easier. Um, the other part too is that I think you know if if you've done any work with the classic Linux environments or the enterprise distros, um, there are the cases that there are third-party modules, and usually these are done in external module projects. So they're not kind of a whole source tree. It's just kind of a little directory that's got the code for the modules and basically you point it at the kernel source and build it and that will build the kernel module that you can load with your enterprise kernel or whatever. Um, and this sort of seems initially like a cleaner approach uh, for doing the GKI kernel. So you could say, oh, I'm just gonna do all my modules for my device in a separate little project and, and, and that will just avoid having to keep this duplicate tree. Um, but the issue there is that you're still going to need kernel modules that won't come in the GKI that are in the upstream kernel. And so you're still going to need to be keeping a separate tree with a separate config to get all of those other little kernel modules um, that are already upstream. Um, and it's things like you know the fixed regulator or whatever. Um, and, and so I think in that case it just clutters, it makes it more complicated. So I, I still think it's best to keep all of your modules in, in a kernel source tree rather than in an external modules project. Um, and then the last thing, uh, I haven't gotten to dig very deeply on this, but there is some talk of basically needing uh, uh, not only a um, generic kind of RAM disk, but also a vendor RAM disk that provides the modules um, uh, that the vendor will provide. Um, you know, this, I think there's stuff that's being worked on in Garrett at the moment on this, um, but it will have bootloader implications. So kind of be heads up that you'll need to follow that and, and possibly have modifications to your bootloader to get this all working in the end. Um, and I think, yeah, last, come see the demo on Friday. I'm gonna have a couple different boards running a GKI kernel, or GKI-ish, same kernel. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, you can check it out. All right, that's, I think, it for me, so. Uh, I say find me later. I know there's a lot of different sessions. I don't wanna take too much time from people, so uh, grab me later and I'll take some questions. Okay, thanks. So uh, this is, I'm just gonna talk about on behalf of Amit uh, about ASP and Dragon board, so two boards, DB845 and Pixel 3. Just a, a comment there, it's not the uh, ASP's blue line user debug build target, but it's basically running mainline kernel. So uh, whatever has happened so far on the Dragon board 845C, the patch set is currently under review on uh, Garrett, Android's Garrett. It boots to UI with the uh, Mesa 19.1.3. Uh, super or logical partition support is enabled. Uh, Android gadgets and USB hosts work. Um, the onboard Ethernet and USB Ethernet dongle works. It's right now running a 5.2 kernel, which is based out of the Qualcomm landing team's uh, release DB845C branch and, and then some uh, things from the ASP exper experimental Android 5.2 release tag. 
it's hosted at Amit's link here, so I'll just, what is in progress. So right now, um, there is just one last SE Linux hurdle that we are working out with, uh, with Google folks to get this merged into ASP. Um, GK enablement is in progress, but I think John's uh, demo will, I think, demonstrate that. We need to switch to v v5.3 and start with uh, 5.4 RC, so that's uh, in progress. Right now, we've not really touched audio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, ES, ES, multimedia integration and all. So how do you get started with it? There are a couple of daily builds that are already ongoing. Um, you can uh, check them out at the Snapshots Linaro website. Um, there is a wiki that talks about how to get all of this together and uh, reproduce it. And the bug tracker is the 96 ports bug tracker for uh, DBX45C. Uh, and talking about the ASP running mainline kernel on Pixel 3. So this shouldn't be confused with the ASP's uh, uh, blue line user debug target. Uh, the goal of this project is basically to run a form factor device, which is in this case is uh, Pixel 3 to run with ASP and mainline Linux kernel and uh, Fridreno graphics stack. So uh, that's that's true, by the way, for the 845C as well. It's also running Fridreno to boot to UI. Um, so since last connect, we have some path set under review. It's very similar. The super logical partition support is enabled. A uh, couple of patches supports are, uh, uh, patches are added for handling the Micron UFS reset support that took us a long time to actually uh, sort out. Um, the reboot bootloader support is added. Both of these patches are on. Yeah, so these are these are in 5.4 already. Uh, and uh, we are working with uh, uh, the Qualcomm landing team and Qualcomm guys to get the display drivers uh, update. Basically, the DSS support is already there, but we need support for DSC. I'm going to talk about that in detail in the next set of slides. So how do you get started? You can just have a look at the wiki, and uh, that should have all the information we need. Uh, I'll just elaborate on the enabling panels. So that's basically the second part of the presentation. Uh, on Pixel 3, it's an estimate 45 based phone. It has a command mode panel, uh, 1048 to 1020 to 2160. Um, uh, pixels. Uh, the, I wrote an upstreamable panel driver, which was basically converted from the downstream DTSI-based one, uh, converted to the upstream DRM panel-based one. Um, a good starting point to do that is at the Fridrino wiki, which has a link uh, here in the slide. We had to convert some timings and uh, basically panel commands over to, uh, I mean, uh, from the DTS to how it is to be sent over the MIP commands, how they need to be sent over to uh, the MIPI processor, DSI. Uh, I added backlight support, and then John added the pin mux and suspend resu uh, resume support. So uh, before we could do that, there are some prerequisites. So the lab IBB regulator support, the patches were posted upstream, but they've not really gotten merged. So that's something I need to push upon uh, with the Qualcomm landing team. And it needed a set of patches, uh, basically, to inherit clocks and regulators that are enabled by the bootloaders. So Rob Clark has posted out those patches, and uh, I was able to use those to have something. So it boots to UI, uh, sort of. And that thing that you see is basically because uh, uh, the display stream compression is utilized on the command mode panels in most of phones uh, to enable using one single lane of DSI to drive a panel of this size. And that support is missing upstream. It's not a trivial fix, so we are working with Qualcomm landing team and uh, with Qualcomm to get this sorted out so that future phones or future devices that have, that require DSC uh, can just run mainline. So what could we do? We tried out with, yeah, the, these are the issues uh, with the current upstream display. It's driving a single line, D a single DSI lane for uh, this size and command mode, so it seems to require DSC support, and that's missing upstream, so. <clears throat> so what we did was we tried to see if we could figure out another phone which is based on the same SOC and uh, does not have a command mode panel. Luckily, we found a one in the Poco F1, which is like a, a mid-tier priced um, 
flagship kind of a phone for SD Mate 45 based. It has a video mode panel, a uh, little higher resolution, but being video mode, I think it doesn't need uh, DSC. Uh, it has the same dependencies as Pixel 3, so it needs the Lab IB support and uh, uh, patches to inherit the clocks and regulators from bootloader. And the panel driver is, uh, I mean, the mechanism to create the panel driver is very similar. You just have to convert from the DTSI over to the DRM panel uh, requirements. Uh, pin mux suspend resume support is needed as well. And so this one does boot to UI. Uh, I don't have touchscreen support enabled, but it's, it at least shows the home screen. And you can, uh, using ADB, you can mimic some keys if you want to. So work in progress says basically DSC, like I mentioned, needs to be enabled in upstream kernel. We'll work with Qualcomm and Qualcomm landing team to get that work done. Um, and currently, the boot animation shows as a white screen. So Alistair had given me some ideas, but I just didn't have time to uh, fix those. But that's, that's under investigation. I should acknowledge a few guys here for the whole of uh, DB845 uh, with the SP work. So Rob Clark with all his work on Fidreno and uh, you know answering all our stupid queries. Bjorn for all the work that he's doing, uh, translating the downstream things into upstream. Qualcomm landing team, Code Aurora, and the Android kernel team. So thank you, guys. <coughs> I'll just move over quickly to the LTP DDT into LTP. So LTP DDT is basically LTP DDT is basically a Linux test project uh, device driver testing, which was created and uh, is hosted by TI. And uh, our idea is to make sure that, to try and enable movement of those device specific patches into LTP so that it's one test uh, framework. So what have we done? We've uh, run about 2,000 tests plus tests on uh, Hikey. Uh, before this effort, the LTP DDT only used to run on TI platform. So this was the uh, this was one of the objections that the LTP maintainers had about trying to merge LTP DDT. That uh, you know it used to run on only one platform. So being able to run it on Hikey was sort of a, a good uh, um, a good uh, supporter of the case of merging LTP DDT into LTP. We, uh, the pass rate is very low, but that's because uh, we are still sorting through what kinds of problems are there, and some of them have been fixed, so we've been working through those. Um, Orson's, Orson and his team have been able to debug 13 subsystems, and they've analyzed more than 100 test cases uh, and written patches, more than 20 patches to fix those. So what are the kind of problems that they found? Um, LTP DDT is heavily designed for hardware from TI. So most, there are a lot of test cases that are very specific uh, and are not designed uh, keeping in view of, keeping in view how other chip vendors might use those subsystems. Then there are some cases that depend on third party commands and tools. So the case, naturally test case fails if the command is uh, not available. Uh, TI uses some Yocto recipes to resolve it, but it may not be as easy for others. Then there is uh, not a lot of auto-skipping code. So there is no auto-detection, auto-skipping of test cases. Test cases just fail if some of the dependencies are not met. Uh, as uh, an analysis, so basically these are some of the cases where an ALSA subsystem, that's the fail log entry, root causes, there's no sound card on, on high key. So it should actually have auto detection and it should report as tconf. Um, likewise for MMC, um, MMC is not configured as a kernel module, so that should be relate, I mean, reported as tconf. SPI had few errors where uh, this error was interesting because uh, dev SPI dev was removed from v3.18 kernel and uh, we were uh, testing with 4.14 on high key. So um, either we can upgrade the test case with new kernel or report tconf instead of error. And then I had a few others. So UART uh, had some tools dependency uh, which was not installed on the uh, file system we were using. So the suggestion was to mark, this, uh, mark these third party dependencies in files and have a separate script that could check the environment. On ARMv star kind of uh, 
uh, tests, uh, what happens is on Busy, BusyBox, the machine name is hard-coded. So if uh, you add a new, if you try a new board, it just fails. So we added entry for high key, but probably there needs to be a cleaner fallback to uh, handle these kind of cases. Um, on GPIO, there were scripts in test cases. There were like two or three problems. So the uh, scripts in test cases couldn't find what interrupt number was there for high key. So there needs to be a better way to get interrupt info and GPIO settings that maybe read it from DTB. Uh, high key needed to be configured with GPIO banks and bits information. And there is no GPIO test KO, which probably exists only in TI kernel source. So it might be interesting, to, it might be a good idea to release kernel module code with test cases altogether. And on IPC and USB sides, we couldn't find kernel modules which are required for testing. So maybe the suggestion was to figure out uh, the kernel modules code with test cases and uh, build modules only when, when, when you're compiling the test binary, then build the modules as well. What's next? So uh, that's a little ambitious from Orson, but what he wants to do is pick up mass requirement test cases for uh, SOC vendors and upstream them back to LTP main trunk and rewrite if necessary. Uh, good news is that uh, we started on the upstream path. So um, we have prepared the patches to upstream URDTT cases. This is being discussed and reviewed with uh, Carlos, who's the who's a TI uh, employee and also the DDT maintainer. So once uh, the review is done, he is going to send these uh, upstream very soon to the LTP mailing list. And that's it from me. So thanks. Duncan, you're up. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Yung Xin Liu. Uh, I will give a sh uh, short introduction about the setters on LCR and our KFT builds. Uh, first, it's about the LCR. Uh, most, uh, most of them are the same as before, uh, except that uh, we, have the, we have some uh, automotive build uh, set up. Uh, and the unwritten based build is under progress now. Next is about the RKFT builds. Uh, we test kernel from 4.4 to uh, Android mainline. And uh, with uh, the Android user space, including uh, 8.1 8 to AOSP master. Uh, we have some builds uh, working now. Uh, one is the GSA builds. Mm. We have uh, CTS, VTS test results for uh, for the uh, GSI builds that we use uh, Android 10. Mm. But uh, uh, there, uh, the build is mainly uh, on HiKey Hi and HiKey 960. Uh, but no, uh, from, uh, no, there is still no GSI image, uh, QGSI image for ARM32 yet. And uh, there is real problem to use to to set up the OSP master with the QGSA. Yet another thing we are working on is uh, to enable the GKI image with the OSP master. Mm, we have set up the CI build already, uh, and I it can can boot to home screen locally, but. Uh, but still not able to get result CTS and test with VTS test result with uh, Lava jobs. Uh, some kernel crash is reported there, but I need to uh, try to reproduce the locally to see more details. Another thing is about the using pure pure Ceylon for the kernel views. Mm, I tried what I tried. Uh, the result of what I got um, is some build errors uh, on with uh, assembling files. No, if I do not specify the, to use the GCC. <coughs> also, I uh, 
still not know how to uh, build the kernel. We build the Android kernel with Ceylon uh, for ARM32 platform yet. Uh, here are some, some tests we do for LKFT builds. Here are some problems I might uh, when set up the builds with the Android mainline. First, uh, First one is that when I run uh, make make a kernel, make a image C command, there is a there is a config selection popped up to wait for manual input. Uh, the workaround I do is to specify C long the C long option like C C then C uh, equal C long uh, when I run make config command. The second uh, problem is ADB stack stack problem when you when using the uh, USB DW3 drivers there is a fix uh, already but uh, I, from uh, what I know uh, it is still not integrated into the Android mainline branch yet. Uh, another problem is the this, this one for the X15, it failed to, uh, to build with error so related to VDSO kernel uh, files. The workaround is to specify to use the RD BFD uh, version exp uh, explicitly when build the kernel. For others, uh, there are some other uh, workarounds patches in I. Uh, Right in the RKFT mainland patch set scripts, you could check you could check that if you are interested. Mm, there are some uh, also some prob uh, problem on debugging uh, for the RKFT views. Uh, first, I found that the uh, Git by fact is not that helpful to find the by, uh, the root cause commit. Mm, what I do uh, is to uh, Something like the by sec the uh, based on the files, not based on the commits. Mm. Luckily, we have jo uh, John monitors the uh, Linux Linux uh, branch, and he uh, could he would know the uh, problem uh, if there is any broken problem. He knows that first. So if we we have any problem, we will ask him first. <laughs> mm. Another problem that we uh, have is that how to run, uh, how to generate the vendor image and the RAM disk image uh, with the kernel modules out of the AOSP tree. Now we, gener uh, we just copy and copy to the uh, image files with the tools like uh, image tools, uh, uh, image tools sim, uh, plus image and the CPIO tools. Uh, the GK, now we build the uh, GK builds with two uh, kernel trees. One is, one tr kernel tree is on, uh, only to generate uh, the GK image and another one is to generate the modules with uh, uh, vendor patches, but uh, from what I found, uh, to build the modules, it will also build the kernel files. So that uh, uh, makes the build time t two times. Oh, we also have a report system. Uh, there are mainly two uh, features we uh, added from last connect. One is to generate uh, a PDF version report automatically. Uh, another one is to call the Jenkins, uh, Jenkins API to get the CI build status for RKFT build projects. Here are some uh, screenshots about the system. Oh, that's all. Oh, 
I have a question about the G size. I remember um, when Android Pi landed, we were building GSI by ourselves. And uh, you just said that there is no GSI for Android Q yet. Can't we build it? Because uh, as, as far uh, as I know, there is a target for GSI. For Pi, uh, for Pi based, Pi version based uh, GSI, there is the instructions on how to build uh, the 32 uh, version GSI. Um, for Android 10, I still not find uh, the instructions. And uh, is and there is there a target, or there is no target yet? For 32. Yes, for 32 bits. I I, I not found yet. Ah. I just found there is Android uh, Android 10, uh, which has tag released, but I have not tried that yet. Okay, thanks. So I have two questions, uh, both related to 32-bit 30, uh, builds, uh, one for Yon Queen and one for John. So first one, uh, Yon Queen, do you know why, why we can't actually build uh, the kernel, right, with clan, with clan for 32 bits? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it's fine. So, uh, John, uh, about, let me remember. Just forgot. So about J GKI image uh, for 32 bits, you actually mentioned that uh, the GKI dev config is only available for ARM64, right? Uh, no, I think they've got uh, at least x86 and ARM64. There may be an ARM32. I haven't actually looked, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm getting no's. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, uh, do you think it's actually worth it to investigate? Uh, uh, does it actually make any sense to investigate this uh, topic for 32 bits because we only, only have one 32 bit uh, platform in ASP, right? So is it actually worth it? I, I, would, I would recommend reaching out to the kernel team at Android <laughs> to get an official answer on that because um, that's not something I can really assess. Um, you know, I think even though there's, you know, maybe only one board in AOSP, you know, there may be other vendors. I really don't know. Um, so, I don't know. I feel like the GKI process might be useful just to do so that we're consistent with how other boards in AOSP work, even if it's on its own. But, again, I'm not any sort of official word on that, so I'd, I'd reach out to the Google devs. <laughs> Yeah, so 32-bit is not a priority for GKI right now, and I, if I were you, I wouldn't spend time okay. on it. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay. When are we going to see GKI for DB845C? Um, so as soon, we basically have a small set of patches that we're in that kind of negotiating phase as to what we'll need to go in and what we need to fix. Um, there's a few things uh, like that clocks being inherited from the bootloader that we need to uh, figure out where it's like just, it's not even something that's in a module, it's just something that we need to either fix upstream or not. Um, those, uh, you know, assuming those can get resolved, I think we, we've got it. I mean, it's going to be one of the boards in the demo is the DB845 running a common kernel with Heike 960 and Heike. So. Common kernel, but not GKI, I assume. Well, DB845. I mean, it, it is the GKI plus the bit of what I'm calling the technical debt that we need to oh, figure okay, out yeah. as far as yeah. what we have to upstream. It's the stuff that doesn't work as a module yet or the stuff that, you know, if we set it as a module, it won't boot, you know, those sorts of things. So. Awesome. Super exciting. Yeah. Uh, regarding the clocks and regulators for the display, I'm kind of working on a patch series that's like one step towards fixing it. It doesn't solve it. Oh, no, no, the clocks and regulators getting turned off, handing off properly. So at least it kind of gives enough indication to the clock driver not to turn it off. It gives the right signal at what point it can turn it off. So that should help towards that goal. I guess you have seen Rob's patches that he's posted on his camera. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it, he tries to solve it in a similar way, just tagging a 
something whether uh, clocks have been inherited or not from the bootloader. Maybe we should talk. Okay, thanks. So if there are no other questions, thanks very much. Thanks.